uh, here's a question for you, because one of the things I find really interesting is that there's sort of one of the ways in which I think the Socratic Platonic tradition interacts with the Christian tradition in a very interesting way, and in some sense needs help from it, is that when we have that Socratic insight of waking up and getting a moment of lucidity where we, we catch ourselves in the act of the sin mm -hmm. and we wake up from it and we, we may wake up from it and have an insight in such a way that we can reform the relationship we have with whatever is dynamically attracting us in our attention. But I think one of the difficulties is that that coming into consciousness, that moment of waking up, that Socratic kind of um, light bulb, there's an attendant guilt that immediately attaches itself to that, right? So you were saying before, it's like, when, when I come into a new form of life, a new way of seeing, a new kind of relationship with reality, it's such that whatever came before is now unthinkable to me. Right. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how such a thing could ever have been tenable. Mm. But I think one of the problems is that then there is a second order sin, which is that I'm now despairing over the fact of having sinned. I'm yeah. despairing over the fact of having been guilty. Yeah. I know that somehow the brokenness of the world is a consequence of the way that I framed my relationship to it. And there's something that's irrevocably lost as a consequence of my having failed to be myself by being in right relation with what's most real. Mm -hmm. And then that second order despair, that, that sin, that guilt over the sin itself becomes something tremendously inhibitive because then it's almost as though in a kind of weird um sort of perverted platonic problem. It's like the sin becomes the thing about reality that is most real. Mm -hmm. And, and that's like, that's a real problem. And I think that's one of the ways in which the sort of the Socratic tradition kind of comes to a point and it can't go any further. Yeah. Because the Socratic tradition can, can induce the consciousness of sin can mm. wake you up. It can reorient your attention by forcing an aporia on you. But it doesn't necessarily have an answer to the largesse of guilt that you inherit because of waking up. And I think that's why, like Kierkegaard talks about, you know, Christ as being both the pattern and also the redeemer, and that somehow you need both because it's the redeemer that allows for the relief of the guilt such that you can actually refocus and fashion your attention again. But that attendance, like after COVID, I think that's part of, part of what happened. A bunch of people woke up, but they also found themselves with this debt of guilt of having broken themselves all that time mm -hmm. that can't easily be erased. Anyway, I, 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 I go on and on, but I'm just, I'm curious to know what you make of that problem. And, and cause it strikes me as something that you've probably reckoned with. Yeah, I know. I, th I think you're right. And I think, like you said, the image of Christ, you know, as both the shepherd, the redeemer, all this image, but also the judge at the same time. And, and I think that, that that you could understand the logos as having two hands, right? We, we talk, I talked about, I talked about that when we were also in, uh, in Thunder, Thunder Bay, Bay. Yeah. right? The idea of the, the, of a hand, which draws and a hand, which pushes away. And, um, uh, you know, uh, because the logos calls you, right. It's like, it's the point of light that's attracting you. It's the, it's the reason why you're doing things. It's the, and then when you, when you, when you sin, you feel the logos as a, as a judge, because then the distance between you and the logos now is appearing. It's like, it's like this thing is calling me forward. And now I do something which is not in line with, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's missing the mark of where I'm going. And so now it exposes the distance between me and the, and the, uh, and the logos. Um, but I think that, that that's why you kind of need both of those. Let's say in balance at the same time, because if you, you know, you do need that wake up moment, but then you also need to feel the call. And I think that's also why, that's why, you know, in love, it ends up being the main motor for the whole 
thing, you know, yeah. Yeah. this, this, that, that there's love, love coming from the log from above, right? There's love coming from heaven that, that, that is drawing you up. And grace is maybe also a, 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 the way, the Christian way to ex- explain that, you know, it's like in some ways you are dependent on, on the logos more than it's not the opposite. It's like, it's, it's actually the source of your life. And so it's, it's the very fact that you can see it comes from it. Like it, 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 it draws you into it. So it's so, so that I think that first move, right. Where it's not just, it's not just that I see this, you know, I see God and now it's like, okay, well now roll my sleeves up and uh, you know, and now suffer because it's like, I'm so, I'm so far, I have to go up the mountain. I have to, you know, the kind of, this kind of Sisyphus idea where it's like, all right, now roll the hill, roll the ball up the, the hill. But, but I think that if you, I think when we understand the logos properly, there's a, there's actually something up on the top of that hill. Like it's, there's something calling you, there's something drawing you into it. So it makes the weight light, you know, it's like that, that's what Christ says. It's like my, my yoke is, is light, you know, it because it, because it's, because it's actually moving towards more reality. And so you, you kind of are called by it. That's right. That's right. And then I think the question becomes, what does it take for the individual to train his ear to condition the receptivity to that call? And maybe that's where kind of the, that, that maybe that's the really properly speaking, the existential role of the suffering, which is that what it does is it, because it, it exhausts the inward resourcefulness of your ego, it kind of leaves you with no choice, right? It makes you sort of, you're sort of so rent apart. You're so ribbon that it sort of sensitizes you. It disposes a kind of vulnerability that opens you to the possibility of being called forth by something outside of you. And yeah. I mean, right. Cause there's this, there's this idea right, right through the tradition of that you have to somehow sensitize yourself to the possibility of God's love. Yeah. And it sounds so easy, but it really, really isn't, especially when your own guilt becomes the measure of everything that's real about you. It becomes almost defiant and demoniacal in that sense, yeah. right? like your the what your your ontological priorities actually favor the sin, um, because it for like these deep Platonic reasons, it just well this seems to be more real than any possibility of goodness that could exceed it. I can't imagine such a thing. Yeah, and well, I don't sense, know in the in the Platonic in the Platonic s- systems if people have also developed the notion of of this fractal the of a fractal way of dealing with this which is in the, in the bible or at least what christ way presents it or you know when you see it in the uh, our father which is you know uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us and so this idea of practicing grace or practicing compassion is also a way to kind of enter into that path so if you can't you can't see the way in which grace can pull you up, but then you can actually do that to others. Yes, and when you true. do it to others, you enter into the pattern. And I think that it makes it probably possible for kind of grace to act on you because Beautiful. it's like, I'm seeing, you know, it's like, I, I'm letting something go, you know, right? Someone yes. did something against me. I'm letting it go. I'm exercising grace. And so, you know, all of a sudden it becomes a possibility. It becomes transitive. It becomes yeah. transitive. That's right. That's beautiful, right? So that by participating on on in one aspect of the pattern, right? You you actually, yeah. It's it's like you. It's like you invoke a belief in the capacity in in being able to take on the opposite aspect to the one yeah. that you're actually acting out, right? And people people have to be careful. They don't. It's not like a. It's not like a. It's not like a transaction, right? It's not no. like okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this for no. others, so then I get from that it's rather just an embodying something and by embodying it then you part you are necessarily participating in it it's like being related to it i think is yeah there you go it's like you enter whatever side of the relation you happen to be on right if it's analogized as 
it, right? It, because it's the same, ultimately a fractal of the same pattern, you're ultimately relating yourself in the pattern in such a way that you're assuming a role within it. But that also means that the part in the pattern that you play plays host to the whole of the pattern, which is what makes it by definition symbolic, right? When the yeah. part presence is the whole. And so it's it's almost as though because you're embodying somehow the whole of the pattern and the part that you play within it, there's there kind of inculcates a belief, a, not a belief in the propositional sense, but like yeah. a belief in an enacted, a sensitization to that pattern that allows you to turn in 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 the opposite direction and see it on a different scale. And and, and there's and there, I think there's also like a there's also the reverse to that. And no, but I think. It's not like I said. It's not a system. We have to be careful because we can always find counterexamples of of this. But I I have noticed, for example, that let's say let's say people who are capable of engaging in uh, let's say in generosity and a kind of and a kind of giving of themselves and a capacity to let's say also try to find the good in others, you know, in their first response, ultimately end up often being also surrounded by that, that that is that it actually grows and they do end up attracting people that have that goodness. And so often people end up living in a world that's more full of goodness. And the opposite is true as well. People who, 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 let's say, act, let's say dishonestly towards the people around them at some point start to also attract that from the people that interact with them. And so they end up in a world of mistrust, you know, both the way they act, but also what they receive from the world. And so there's actually like a, so people can actually inhabit, like you really can inhabit different worlds just by the way they act and the, what they see as how would they prioritize and how they act, not just in what they do, but when what they receive, I don't, I can't explain it scientifically, but it's definitely something no, no, but, that but, I've noticed. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. I notice it too. I think, I think once you, once you have eyes on it, like once, I mean, that's like what we were talking about before. Once you begin, once you begin to, to pick up these patterns, they're pretty hard to mistake. 